to another episode of What the Forensics. My name is Journey and I am joined here today by the lovely Rebecca and Nicole. This week, Rebecca will be telling us all about the case of Stephen Truscott and Nicole will be educating us on the science of forensic entomology and how it played an instrumental role in this case. (laughs) Um, I would also like to note that there is a listener's discretion advised as there are detailed descriptions of child death and sexual assault. And with that, I will pass it on to Rebecca, who's going to tell us all about Stephen Truscott, who he was, and what he did. All right. Thank you, Journey. Um, So to get started, like we usually do, I'm going to go into his early life a little bit. Um, So Stephen Truscott was born in Vancouver, BC on January 18th of 1945 to his father, Dan Truscott, who was a non-commissioned Air Force officer, as well as his mother, Doris Truscott. He did also have three siblings. Um, I wasn't able to find whether they were older or how younger, uh, but later on, it does mention that he had to go babysit them. So I presume that they were all younger than him. Um, So... Stephen, growing up, was known by his friends and, like, others in the community as, like, a pretty popular and athletic kid. Just everyone liked him. He was just very social. Um, And in 1956, the whole family had to move to Clinton, Ontario, uh, which was a rural, very low-crime town that's just uh, made up of 3,500 people. Um, And they had to go there because Stephen's father was stationed there for work because he was in the Air Force. Um, just for a bit of reference, so people know where this is, if you're not familiar with Ontario, Clinton is just like 200 kilometers or so west of Toronto. Uh, so it's a little in the middle of nowhere, but not too far. (laughs) But anyways, for the most part, Truscott's childhood was nothing out of the ordinary, Uh, Despite moving from his hometown when he was only 11, he very quickly adjusted and made some new friends in this new town. One of the friends uh, that he had made, or at least acquaintances, was Lynn Harper. Lynn was a New Brunswick-born girl who also had moved to Clinton because her father, who was also a member of the Canadian Armed Forces, was relocated there with his family in 1957. So both Lynn and Stephen had to move in childhood to Clinton because of their father's positions in the military. Lynn Harper was just about a year younger than Stephen. She was born on August 31st of 1946. Uh, She was described as a very energetic kid, uh, but well-liked child who made friends pretty easily because she was really outgoing. And she was in the Girl Scouts and just very involved in her community. So in 1959, Lynn and Stephen were classmates uh, in a grade 7-8 split class, which... I don't think I need to explain it, but it's just basically when they stick a bunch of grade sevens and a bunch of grade eights into the same class and they just kind of teach them grade eight material and the grade sevens basically skip grade seven. Weird. So uh, around 5.30 p.m. on June 9th of 1959, Lynn Harper returned home from school and asked her parents if she could go for a swim at the Royal Canadian Air Force Base pool. Uh, because they, I think they lived on base. Like, I think this was a military community. So a lot of people there, uh, specifically used all the facilities of the RCAF. Um, the pool had a rule that children had to be accompanied by an adult to swim there, or alternatively, the child with parents permission could obtain a permit to swim unsupervised, uh, from the administrator of the permanent married quarters. I'm not positive what that is, but I take it it's just the administrator of the the military community. Um, So when Lynn's parents said they were unable to take her to the pool, they were just too busy at the time, uh, she went by herself to try and obtain a permit from the administrator. However, because she was unaccompanied by an adult at this time, her request was ultimately denied, so she went back home uh, and ate dinner. After eating dinner and doing some chores, uh, Lynn left the house again, but this time she didn't tell her parents where she was going prior to leaving. So around 6.30 p.m., uh, Lynn arrived at her school to help a teacher set up for the Girl Guides meeting that was happening. And while doing this, she saw Stephen Truscott arrive to the school grounds on his bike. 
So Lynn and Stephen started chatting and Stephen mentioned how he was headed to Bayfield River, which was just like a local swimming spot for some of the kids in this in the community, uh, which was just south of the highway to see if any of his friends were hanging out there so he could go hang out with them. So according to Trescott, after hearing uh, this, Lynn had told him that there was a house just north of Highway 8 that had ponies at it. And she asked if he would take her there because she wanted to go see the horses since she couldn't go swimming. Stephen agreed to bring her as far uh, as the intersection of Highway 8 and the county road, uh, just because it was a bit of a, the opposite direction that he was headed. Um, so Lynn hopped on the handlebars of his bike and they rode off onto the highway together. For some reason, uh, Trescott claims that he stopped. So to clarify, sorry. Um, after he had dropped her off at the intersection, like agreed for whatever reason, uh, he said that he just, he stopped on the bridge and took a look back for a second, I guess, just to make sure that she was getting on okay she was going where she was supposed to um and when he turned around he noticed that lynn was getting into a vehicle uh but he assumed that it might be a family member or like a grandmother of hers and then so he continued on his way to go see his friends he wasn't very concerned about it at the time so after chatting with some friends at the schoolyard when he got back uh he went home around 8 30 p.m to babysit his younger siblings and that's where he stayed for the night the following day uh, was June 10th of 1959. Stephen's mother, Doris, was at home with her husband uh, when someone came to the door. She answered the door and she found Lynn's father, Leslie, uh, was there. And he had asked them if uh, Stephen happened to know where his daughter Lynn was. He told Doris that Lynn didn't come home the night before and was still gone. And he was obviously concerned. Um and in addition to this, he said that someone, although it's not reported who, so it's likely just a schoolmate of Stephen and Lynn's, uh, had told him that, quote, one of the Truscott boys had been seen with Lynn. So Stephen, having nothing to hide, told the father that he did see Lynn last night and that he gave her a lift to this intersection and that he saw her get into someone's car. Um, backtracking just a day. Uh, so the night of June 9th, the night she went missing, Lynn's father also did report this uh, to the base guardhouse. So basically like the local law enforcement, uh, he reported her missing around 1030 p.m. So the following day when he went to their house, it was kind of like he was initiating the search for her a little bit because law enforcement already knew. So the next day, uh, which was June 10th, the same day that he had gone to their house uh, to check where his daughter was, uh, some police officers initiated what they called a casual search of the area uh, that she was last seen in in hopes that they'd be able to find her quickly or easily. Like maybe she just stayed with a friend for the night or something like that. So unfortunately, they didn't find anything on that initial search. Um, so on June 11th, which was the day after the initial one, the uh, Ontario Provincial Police and the military launched a search for Lynn. Uh, it was a very big search. It involved 250 police officers uh, airmen, which was not specified further, but I assume that they just meant like search and rescue helicopters flying overhead, uh, as well as civilian volunteers were all involved in the search. Not too long after the search began, uh, actually on the same day of the initial search, Lynn's lifeless body was unfortunately found in Lawson's Bush, which is not too far from where Stephen had dropped her off two days prior. I would like to also note uh, that Lawson's Bush isn't a town, although like it sounds like it could be. It was actually just a 150 acre farm that was passed down to generations of the Lawson family. And because it was a generational farm through time, the small forest on the property came to be known as Lawson's Bush just because it was a very dense bush and tree forest, essentially. Uh, this forest was often used by teenagers in the 1950s just as like a little local hangout spot, the same as the swimming hole was that was mentioned earlier. So I'm speculating here a little bit, uh, but the Lawson's farm was well known in the community and also happened to have horses. So I'm curious as to whether this was the farm that Lynn was trying to go see when she mentioned she wanted to see ponies, uh, but I wasn't able to find any further information on whether or not it actually was the farm she wanted to get to. So after finding the body, investigators realized that they 
basically walked right past her body on the initial search on March 10th, which is crazy. That's why you don't just do a casual search, but whatever. Uh, So Lynn was found uh, on the ground in the bush, uh, so kind of in the woods a little bit. She was found partially naked and her blouse was tied around her neck. Um, The autopsy revealed that Lynn had been sexually assaulted and the cause of death was strangulation with her blouse. And at the time, Lynn was only 12 years old. So Stephen Truscott, even though he was only 14 when the crime occurred, uh, was immediately considered a suspect because he was the last person to have seen her alive. So on June 12th, uh, Truscott was taken into the uh, Godrich, Godrich police station and questioned for about two hours. During this time, Truscott maintained his innocence and he told the police exactly what he told Lynn's father, that she asked him to bring her closer to a farm to see some horses and that after dropping her off there, he looked back and saw her getting into a vehicle, but he didn't think much of it at the time and continued to bike to the swimming hole where he was going to meet his friends. And despite the very lengthy interrogation, uh, for a child anyways, uh, Truscott's story didn't change. So despite having no confession out of Truscott and also being questioned extensively at this police station, police apparently hadn't heard enough yet. So they transferred him to the Royal Canadian Air Force headquarters for another lengthy interrogation, but this time without his parents present, uh, which, if I remember correctly, is not legal to do to a minor but they didn't care. Um, So again, his story remained the same and he maintained his innocence and gave them the consistent details. So despite having no evidence besides Truscott being the last person seen with her, as well as failing to investigate any other potential suspects on June 13th, just two days after her body was discovered, police have charged Truscott with the first degree murder of Lynn Harper. The timeline is a little fuzzy for the next part, uh, but this either happened just before or just after Truscott was arrested and charged. Bob Lawson, who was the current owner of the 150-acre farm, um, went to the guardhouse at the RCAF base to report that he had seen a strange car that he didn't recognize. Possibly, he said, a 1952 Ford convertible uh, parked right near his fence line for quite some time, and it turns out as we discovered later, that where the driver was uh, parked at the fence was actually pretty near where the body was found. So he told uh, the officer on duty that he and his friend had seen a man sitting in the driver's seat, as well as a shorter girl in the middle front seat. So not the passenger seat, but the one where sometimes there's a seat instead of a, a center console. Yeah, yeah. Uh, There was a shorter girl sitting in that seat, but neither of the men recognized who the people in the car were. So despite this evidence that corroborates Truscott's story, the officer on duty apparently didn't care because he never followed up on this lead. And he told told Lawson that they've already identified a suspect, so they didn't need to look into this further. On July 13th, so a month after Truscott was charged, a preliminary hearing was held to determine whether or not there was enough evidence for them to even put this 14-year-old child on trial. Uh, The Crown argued that Truscott was the last person seen with her and that the body was found near where they had been seen together. So obviously it must have been him. And Truscott's only defense was his word, essentially, that he had dropped her off like he said he did and saw her get into someone else's vehicle. That's it. At the preliminary hearing, it was decided that Truscott would be tried as uh, an adult in adult court because they didn't think the juvenile court had the means to take care of such a heavy case. Um, So that he would be tried in the town's county, which was Huron County. Um... And before the trial and during the investigation, the police found a lot of evidence that should have made them second guess their accusation against Truscott, but they were just so tunnel blind that he's all they wanted to see. Um, So multiple kids from Truscott school had actually corroborated Stephen's story and they confirmed that he was at the swimming hole with them just after dropping off Lynn 
which someone else had seen him do. Someone saw him drop off Lynn. Um, and they also said he didn't appear to be distressed. He had no physical evidence of any sort of struggle or crime being committed. Like there was no blood as you would sometimes expect if someone just murdered someone. Um, and in addition to that evidence, there was also the report that I mentioned earlier that Bob Lawson made about the vehicle, um, being at his property that looked really suspicious, but they just completely ignored it. So even though he like had an alibi and people were saying like yeah he was with us he didn't kill her they were still like no he's guilty we should definitely charge arrest and take him to trial for the murder of this girl yeah exactly that's that. disgusting that's disgusting i know i can't believe it and i know to try him I... as an adult too like he's 14 right that's ridiculous. like i understand it's a heinous crime but he's 14 and they don't have evidence against him yeah yeah, you can't expect a 14-year-old to think like an adult. Like, that's ridiculous. Yeah, it's... This was a very sad case. Um, Would they yeah. do that with all children, though? Like, why was his case specific? Like, did they not think kids would never kill anyone? Like That <laughs> I'm not positive of. Um, I know that oftentimes, even today children who commit murder are tried in adult court. Um, but a lot of times they do still get juvenile sentences. Like they usually are sentenced till they're 18. And then yeah. actually they don't have their records expunged if they've murdered because that's a serious crime. Uh, but either way, <laughs> they don't just a little, but if I remember correctly, no, they, they're still lighter on children unless yeah. it's like a really gruesome crime. Then, then they would be with adults. But this was the 50s. (laughs) Yeah. That should be Um, like a slogan, just a (laughs) catchphrase. Well, it's the 50s. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, The trial commenced on September 16th of 1959 uh, and went until September 30th of the same year. So it was only about 15 days long. At trial, Truscott, just like the entirety of this investigation, maintained his innocence. As evidence in trial, the court introduced 59 witnesses and 76 other pieces of evidence, which included the coroner's report that Lynn had died between 7 p.m. and 7.45 p.m. the night of her disappearance, suggesting that she died while she was with Truscott. The coroner concluded this by uh, taking the contents out of her stomach putting them in a glass jar, holding them up to the light and trying to see basically how decomposed the food in her stomach was. And that's how they decided. But how... Oh my gosh. I can't even like form a question. Um, uh, What is he comparing it to? Like, is this just what he's done? And he has like a whole bunch of vials on a windowsill with different decomp levels. And he's like, "Mm, this looks the closest to that. That's this (laughs) stage. Like, I just... I don't understand that at all. So apparently uh, the time of her last meal was known, like it was around 6.30 or so, I believe. Um, And because they knew the timing of her last meal, I guess it gave him mm, a comparison point. Like I guess compared the fresh food she ate to what it looks like when she died. But either way, putting it in a glass jar and holding it up to the light, what is that going to tell you? Yeah. It reminds me of, like, the Casey Anthony case where he's like, yes, I know the smell of death. Okay, great. Put it in a, <laughs> he put it in a bottle and brought it to the case. I'm like, sir, that's not science. Like, I'm he, sorry. He, he bottled smell? A smell? Is that what right? happened? Yeah. I don't know. I, didn't, I don't know the case very well. I thought he, like, tried to, like, like can the um the smell that was in the trunk to like bring it to court and be like this is what death smells like this is how i know i think you're right i think i remember reading (laughs) about that because i was like that is so weird (laughs) like is this the same person this has to be the same guy (laughs) the same (laughs) trusting his scent and vision it's got to be the same guy (laughs) that's kind of funny i can't even believe it so Yeah, basically, with really faulty methods, the coroner concluded that by examining her stomach contents and comparing the current look of them to the time she had her last known meal, you could tell the time of death. 
Um, Even at the time of the trial, this science was heavily in question, but apparently no one cared about that Uh, because, um, sorry, Um, as well as the coroner's report, various eyewitnesses said for the Crown that they saw Truscott and Lynn together, but we've already established that, that they were seen together. That doesn't make Truscott a murderer. Um, They also introduced evidence that they uh, suggested showed that Truscott had sexually assaulted Lynn uh, because three days after her body was found, they conducted a physical examination of Truscott's body and apparently they had found multiple lesions on his penis. Um, And at the time it was just left as that and they just determined that that shows he sexually assaulted her. Let's move on. Um, quick question. Was there any evidence of sexual assault on her body? I've been reading mixed reports on that, but for, like, most sources do say that she had been sexually assaulted. Okay, so it was plausible that he could have done that. Yeah. Okay. Did they not collect samples? Like, typically you would swab and there'd be possible dna like could they not have done that rather than just being like "Eh, he has some marks on his penis well i know at the time they couldn't have used dna uh oh because it wasn't around the 50s (laughs) Um, (laughs) forgot (laughs) uh however if he was as we talked about in our dna episode or serology sorry if he was a secretor then they still would have been able to get his blood type from the semen, but I didn't see anything that suggested they collected this evidence, and so I'm not sure about that. Don't like that. Um, So even though the Crown arguably put up a pretty good fight, they had a lot of evidence, the defense also put up a pretty good fight. Uh, They introduced 15 witnesses to the stand, Many of these witnesses were there to corroborate Truscott's original story and provide timelines um, that, uh, sorry, to provide timelines that matched with what Truscott had originally told the police and also that contradicted the coroner's report that he had killed her between 7 and 7.45 because a couple of the witnesses had actually specified that they were with Truscott at 7 p.m. So, in addition to these witnesses, an expert witness was called to the stand to discuss the faults of the coroner's method of determining the time of death. In the 1950s, using stomach contents of the deceased was already questionable science, and even today, it's not founded in sound science. Um, But despite the promising evidence that the defense had put forward in the sloppy argument by the Crown, the jury deliberated on September 30th, um, multi- there's variations in how long they deliberated from sources. Uh, it was anywhere between 10 minutes and two and a half hours. Um, but either way, they finished their deliberation the same day of the trial. Uh, and they determined that, uh, Truscott was guilty. However, they did recommend to the judge that they have mercy on him when sentencing as he was just a child. Despite this, The judge didn't listen to the recommendation, and they sentenced him to death by hanging, which would take place on December 8th of 1959, so the same year. Oh. Yeah, I was truly shocked when I read that they sentenced a 14-year-old to death. Yeah, I really don't like that. Yeah, it didn't fully, like, click in my brain until you were like, yeah, they sentenced a 14-year-old to death. Within the same year that he was found guilty. After such a short deliberation. Like, that's incredible. Yeah, I was gonna say, there's, like, cases that have been much worse than this. With a lot better evidence, like, to back up their case. And they still haven't been sentenced to death. Like, that's absurd to me. Yeah, I. it is. It's absolutely absurd. Um, so in the months leading up to December 8th, uh, Truscott spent his time awaiting his death sentence in a small concrete cell on death row in an Ontario, uh, penitentiary. Um, however, 
Due to an appeal that he had submitted to the Supreme Court, the courts decided to delay his execution a few months uh, until February 1960 so that they could allow the appeal time to actually be heard in front of a judge. On January 21st of 1960, uh, the Ontario Court of Appeal uh, made a decision and they unfortunately upheld the conviction. However, they did end up commuting his death sentence to instead a life uh, in prison because of the incredible public outrage that they were sentencing a child to death. So I'm really happy they listened to the public outrage, yeah. especially knowing the full history of this case. He was no longer sentenced to death, but he was still to spend life in prison. Uh, so throughout the years, Trescott was held at various prisons and youth detention centers around Ontario and multiple times had filed for an appeal, even with the Supreme Court of Canada. But at the time of those appeals, each one of them were either upheld, uh, like upheld the decision that he was guilty because they didn't feel there was enough evidence to suggest otherwise, or they simply didn't even take on the appeal case. However, in May of 1967, Seven years uh, after the appeal had determined that he was going to spend life in prison instead, um, the appeal had gone to the Supreme Court of Canada, so he was successful in his appeal attempts. Um, and in a dissenting opinion of one of the judges, so this basically means that they agree with the, def uh, agree with the defense, basically, they're like, yeah, something is wrong here, Um the judge deemed that a new trial should be ordered because of, quote, highly prejudicial evidence, improperly admitted evidence, and incorrect directions in the judge's charge to the jury, unquote. So uh, while awaiting this trial, Truscott was held for another two years in prison um, and then was released in October of 1969 uh, to await this new trial. And at the time, uh, the courts have give, had given him a new name so that they, he would be protected in public and people wouldn't harass him. I'm not positive when the new trial occurred, because it almost seems like everyone just forgot about it and there's no mention of it. Um, so he was sort of a free man from 1967 up until where I'm speaking now. However, he wasn't exonerated. So these were still on his record. Um, so in September of 1997, uh, so about 20 or 30 years later, Truscott had agreed uh, to have a DNA test performed on him in the hopes that uh, it could exonerate him because there was new technology at the time, DNA, uh, that had been used to exonerate two other people prior to him. And in addition, there was a lawyer who actually specialized in wrongfully convicted uh, cases that agreed to take on his case and help him try to get exonerated. So in November of 2000, the Association in Defense of the Wrongfully Convicted, uh, which is a group that establishes, or sorry, attempts to establish innocence of wrongly convicted individuals, they also joined his case. So now he had a very special, specialized lawyer as well as a whole association working with him. Um, and then in November 2001, so a year after this association is helping him, uh, they helped him apply to the federal minister of justice for a review of his case on the grounds that the conviction was a miscarriage of justice. Um, this is not an appeal. Uh, it's actually something different entirely uh, because it focuses on miscarriages of justice. So immediately this was granted because they needed to investigate why they were claiming this. So after a very lengthy investigation, it was determined that, quote, there was clearly a reasonable basis for concluding that a miscarriage of justice likely occurred, unquote. This was concluded by reanalyzing the evidence that had been collected at the time of Harper's death, which included the, the analysis of stomach contents, the decomposition of her body when it was found, uh, as well as the extent of the rigor mortis in her body when she had been found. So because of this decision that there definitely was a miscarriage of justice, they ordered a new trial through the Court of Appeal in June of 2006, uh, and in this trial, they were going to use new evidence that actually contradicted the original coroner's findings. So they admitted an expert witness to the stand to discuss the faults of determining the time of death and the use of stomach, sorry, stomach contents 
Um, and the witness uh, actually reported that the time of death noted on Dr. Peniston, who was the coroner doctor, uh, the death time of death reported on his autopsy was not scientifically valid the valid scientific technique which uh nicole is going to tell us about more later and i'm going to briefly describe in a second um is entomology and it suggested that the stage of the body the histology and the weather suggested that her time of death was actually probably the day or night of June 10th, 1959. So at least a full day after the original cor coroner report stated she had died. Uh, so as I mentioned, Nicole is going to teach us all about entomology in a few minutes. Um, however, based on their analysis, uh, sorry, based on the expert witnesses analysis of the coroner's uh, report, as well as a recreation experiment of the insect evidence that was originally collected. Um, they found that the initial fly colonization actually occurred during daylight hours uh, of June 10th, 1959. The collected larvae uh, from the scene were actually not likely to have been deposited on the body before dark on June 9th, uh, because this would have resulted in much larger and much more advanced uh, larvae then were collected at the scene or autopsy. So this analysis done by the expert witness together with the pathology uh, reanalysis of the stomach content analysis and its faults uh, actually demonstrated that the original estimate of time of death was actually unreliable. So in addition to this, they had found that there were two previously reported, uh, sorry, there were two previous reports done by the coroner of the original uh, death report that were never disclosed to the courts, not even the Supreme Court. Um, and both of these other reports actually did reveal different times of death. So you can tell that the coroner wasn't terribly confident in his analysis of it, but he chose to hide this from the justice system. It blows my mind that they can just not disclose evidence and be like, yeah, I'm just going to keep this to myself just because I don't want you to have it. Like that, how does that even cross your mind? You're like working for the justice system and you're like, no, this is mine. I don't want to share. It seems very unjust. Very unjust. Like I can't believe it. Like if that's your job is to solve crime, like why wouldn't you like do your job? I completely agree. Um, so the two undisclosed reports by the coroner, Dr. Penniston, uh, which indicated different times of death, had used alternate methods of analyzing the time of death. And one of these was based on the entomological evidence of the bugs that were found on or near her body when she was found. Um, and as we have just briefly mentioned, Entomology is much more scientifically sound and reliable to estimating time of death than is analyzing stomach contents. So finally, um, a testimony from a dermatologist at this appeal had indicated that the lesions that were found on Truscott's penis were actually consistent with a pre-existing skin condition that Truscott had. Um, I'm not sure why this was overlooked by police, but I again think that it was just a case of tunnel vision and they were just trying to find facts to fit the holes. Um, so on August 28th of 2007, um, the Ontario Court of Appeal had determined that Truscott was indeed a victim of a miscarriage of justice and that he must be acquitted of all crimes as soon as possible. So a little under a year later, um, a report was written that on March 28th of 2008, I hadn't mentioned the date, I'm sorry, um, a report was determined uh, that Truscott must be compensated for his uh, troubles and they awarded him six and a half million dollars and his wife was given an additional 100,000 for lost income during these this decade long process. You know, I'm not going to say that it excuses it, but with the amount, well, wow, English, um, with the amount of time that he spent in jail, but six and a half million dollars is kind of nice, I would say. Yeah, that's a lot I of money. Agree. I agree. I mean, even... it doesn't make up for the loss of time, yeah. but it's 
it's a start. It's, it's, it's a, a start. nice sum. It, you don't have to work ever again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and to, like, compensate his wife, too, for lost income. Like, is that something that courts do nowadays? Because that seems very... Like, I don't want to say generous because they screwed his life up, but, like... (laughs) I haven't heard of any cases, but that's not to say that they haven't done it or they don't do it. Like, this was the first one I've heard of it, but... Yeah, same. I was going to say the same thing. It it could have happened again, uh, but I haven't heard any reports of it. Yeah, Yeah. fair enough. Um, But after being compensated for the damages and troubles that the justice system had caused... Um, there's not a lot of information anymore about Stephen Truscott. Um, I think he's living a relatively private life, um, but he's now living in Ontario with his wife and they've raised three children together. And I really hope they're having a good and happy life because this man did not deserve this. I agree. Yeah, I agree. So all of these problems with this case and Stephen Truscott being wrongfully convicted and people believing he was guilty of it for over a decade, essentially, or sorry, almost five decades. Um, Because of the incredible tunnel vision, we have no idea who actually killed Lynn Harper. The killer is unknown. We may never know just because of the faults in the investigation and we don't really have enough evidence to continue digging into it. Um, But I just think that it's really sad that their family are never going to get closure for what happened. I think two lives were ruined the day of that murder. Definitely. Yeah, no, that's very sad that they will never know, especially because it's been 50 years. Like the statute of limitations has passed. Like it's pretty much done, which is heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. But yeah, thank you, Rebecca, for telling us all about Stephen Truscott and Lynn Harper and their devastating story. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Nicole to tell us all about entomology, which is not to be confused with etymology, which is the study of words and meanings. She's going to be teaching us about bugs. So yes, very different. (laughs) I will say bugs. Yes. So as you said, Entomology is the study of insects, not words. Um, And so thinking of it in a forensic sense, forensic entomology is the application of this study of insects to the law. And so there's actually three major subfields to forensic science or to this science. Um, I'll get into that later. I just wanted to kind of begin with the history of the field at first. Um, So surprisingly, the first reported use of forensic entomology comes from the 13th century Chinese medical legal textbook, and this was written by a Sung Tzu. Um, He was a lawyer and a death investigator. I think there's also a general with that name. I I think they're different people. I have a strong thought that they're different people. I haven't really looked into it. Um, But anyways... He described a case where a stabbing had occurred and someone was killed near this rice field. So the following day, what he had everyone do or what was done was all of the workers from that field were asked to lay out their tools. So their sickles um, as they had laid them out under the heat and sun. So what happened was the traces of blood that were still on this sickle, although it wasn't visible to the naked eye, it did attract blowfi- blowflies, excuse me. So it indicated that there was biological evidence, there was blood on this sickle, and then that had to have been the murder weapon. So when the owner of that tool was confronted, they confessed to the murder. And so this is the first like real documented case and use of forensic entomology, which is pretty cool. Um, And surprisingly, there's also early documentation from the Middle Ages that illustrate this kind of stuff. So there's um, uh, pictures and I forget, I think it's an imprint, like it's a print of some sort. I don't know. It's really cool looking. It illustrates a skeleton and a dead body with maggots all over him. It's a really beautiful picture, I will say. I'll add it into our sources. Um, That sounds... Yeah, that sounds so cool. I have no idea what it looks like, but it sounds really cool. Yeah. 
Um, and so that was kind of hinting at entomological evidence. It wasn't really, it didn't go much further in depth, but in 1767, a biologist had stated that three flies would destroy a horse as fast as a lion would. So again, this is kind of just illustrating the role that flies have in kind of the decomp process and eating meat, essentially. <laughs> um, and although there are documents that date back to the 13th century here, there isn't a great deal that goes on in this time period, really, until the 18th and 19th centuries. There's some documentation here and there, but it's nothing concrete. Um, and so during the 18th and 19th centuries, max e mass exhumations, excuse me, took place in France and Germany during this time. And so this really helped advance the science because medical legal doctors were noticing that a whole bunch of arthropods were living in these corpses and skeletons. So they knew that it had to have an important part in it and they wanted to investigate that further. In 1855, French doctor Bergeret, he wrote a case report which included how to estimate post-mortem interval, or PMI, which I'll be most likely referring to for the rest of the episode. Um, this is the elapsed time since death. And so this make, made it the first modern documentation of forensic entomology, which is pretty neat, considering 1855 isn't really modern in my definition, but apparently that's the first modern one. Yeah, that's a long time ago. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, and so along with this postmortem interval, this PMI estimation, he discussed the general life cycles of insects. But here he unfortunately incorrectly assumed that the metamorphosis, so the, um, the development from egg to adult, would take an entire year on average to happen, which... We know, I hope all of you know, that is not the case. It's quite quick, actually. Um, but at the time, they didn't know that. So he said that it took a full year for an egg to hatch into an adult fly. And in the same paper, <clears throat> excuse me, he also made the assumption that female insects generally laid their eggs in the summertime. I'm not sure if it was because of the warmer weather that that's what caused him to think that. Um, but with this predicted year-long development cycle and um, the whole laying their eggs in the summertime, his assumption then indicates that larva would develop into a pupae, which is in the development cycle I'll get into, the following spring. So I don't know if winter didn't exist and fall didn't exist um, or if it was just too cold for them at that time but he said that they would develop into pupae the following spring and then hatch that summer and so I will note though the focus of his paper wasn't on forensic entomology itself um, but it was used and I think still is I guess um, it was used as a tool by early forensic entomologists so going a bit later, in 1881, a German doctor who was working on these mass exhumations, he was the first to publish a systematic study in forensic entomology, and so he had conducted research on furrowed flies and beetles, um, and he was looking at them that were in graves that were older than 15 years, so quite a long period of time. I'm not entirely sure what his findings were. Um, I did, uh, wow, English. I did post a source that goes into the whole history of it. So it has all of the documentation and all of the studies basically from the 1800s. Um, but they weren't, they're kind of just like here and there studies, in my opinion, at least. So I kind of just did the general scope of them for this. But anyways... Um, a, another researcher, Jean-Pierre Mignon, he began to develop theories surrounding predictable life cycles of different insects that were found on corpses. So he published his findings in an 1887 book called La Fun de Tombeau, and this translates to fauna of the tombs. So basically animals 
living organisms of the tombs, I guess animals. Um, between 1883 and 1894, Meunier would publish 14 more papers as well as another book, sorry, as well as another book titled La Fun de Cadavre, um, which basically became a very, very influential text in this field. So here he had expanded his theory on insect su- successional waves, which I also get into, um, on exposed corpses, as well as those buried. So he originally thought that like there were eight cycles to a life of a fly. Then he narrowed that down to four um, four exposed cadavers or corpses, I guess. And then it was two cycles, he said, for buried corpses, which isn't really the case. So he did also cover several different insects in their larval and adult stages. Um, So it wasn't just on one specific type. He did have a bit of a variety in there, which was quite nice. Um, But Menya not only advanced the science of forensic entomology with his um, documents, but he also played a really important role in popularizing the subject. So it actually, the interest in forensic entomology then spread to Canada and the United States um, specifically, at least what I found in my texts. But then it did take this like worldwide interest following this. So in 19, nope, not 19, in 1895, not in the 1900s yet, um, Canadian researchers began uh, conducting a lot of studies on human corpses because they were inspired by Menyen's work. And so they aimed to refine Menyen's work as well as making it more specific to, the, to Canadian environments and our native fauna. So they were seeing that not a lot of it could be applied to them because they were just were different insects. They didn't have the same species to work with. And so during this time, um, in the same time period, American researchers were also conducting their own studies where they exhumed over 150 corpses in Washington, D- in Washington D.C. to um, study insects and entomology, which is kind of cool. Um, So now, during the 1900s, we are finally there, (laughs) during the World Wars, uh, research continued to advance in forensic entomology with various lists and documentations of species that were critical and very important to forensic contexts. These were finally being published. And so these publications had more of a focus on ecology, metabolism, and or like the anatomy of various insects. And something I thought was really cool too, an interest in pest control as well as maggot therapy increased during this time. And these two things are said to have been a major scientific source that forensic forensic entomologists would use when interpreting insect evidence. So the field... Yeah. So... (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Is that like... When they'd put maggots on, like, dead flesh to kind of, like, eat it away so yep. that the healthy flesh could regrow? It's exactly that. So, with living people, if they have, I think it's called necrosis or something, like, when they have mm-hmm. dead skin, they will put maggots on that dead skin to eat the dead tissue. And I learned this, well, I don't know when my mom told me this, but I remembered it frequently <laughs> this year. Um my grandmother on her side uh, apparently got maggots in her cast and the maggots are what actually prevented them from having to amputate her foot because they oh my were, gosh they were eating all of the dead skin um, that from I guess the cast was too tight or something like that so they were eating all of that dead skin and it didn't go further into something that would lead to amputation that's crazy yeah that's so cool (laughs) so it wasn't like purposeful maggot therapy uh but it did work (laughs) it did work (laughs) that's crazy okay yep so you're welcome for that just if you ever have dying skin find some maggots they may be able to help (laughs) anyways um 
the field through this, um, actually through pest control, learned that adult flies could be present before an animal or human died, which would impact PMI estimations. And then this maggot therapy gave insight into how they functioned and had a part in dying skin and eating it and that whole process as we just talked about. And so between 1960s and the 1980s, a Marcel Leclerc, a Benj- Belgian doctor, I'm incapable of speaking tonight, it seems, um, as well as a Pekka Nuorteva, I'm going to go with that, a professor of biology, um, they were the two that kind of maintained the field during these 20-year like period, um, and they focused a lot of their energy on casework. Um, So after this, in 1996, the American Board of Forensic Entomology was created. And this is basically just a certification board for that field. And so it's similar to those where, like, there's the certification and the board of forensic odontologists and forensic anthropologists. It's basically just a group of professionals who are certified and they make up this board. But since then... Um, The application of forensic entomology has really continued to advance and expand worldwide, and it's frequently used in criminal investigations now, um, which is really neat to see. And so now that we've covered kind of the general history, um, I wanted to go into how it can be used in a legal context, so the whole forensic aspect to it. As I mentioned, there are three major subfields of forensic entomology, and these are stored product urban, and medico-legal forensic entomology. So the first subfield, stored product forensic entomology, this has to do with insects infesting products, either like once they've already been packaged or after certain products have been like harvested and stored. So an example of this would be like moths being found in rice boxes. I guess that's a common thing that happens. Um... If this box had been, like, stored in a pantry and then moths are in there, uh, a forensic entomologist would be responsible for, like, trying to figure out where the infestation started, what insects are present, um, what development stage they're in, and then kind of piece everything together to provide an opinion. Um, Another example is beetles being found in food boxes in warehouses. I guess that's also a common thing. I did not know. Um, but they may be called on as expert witnesses to provide their opinion on the matter. And this is most often in civil cases, um, usually between companies or what, or businesses, that whole thing. Um, but it can happen in criminal cases as well, where food contamination has occurred. The second subfield, urban forensic entomology, This has to do with infestations and unwanted insects in buildings or other structural environments. So this could be like our homes, a school calf, a hospital, really anywhere that you don't want insects. So an entomologist would assess, again, the level of infestation, how bad it is, what species are present in addition to their development stage as well. Again, giving a possible explanation for the how and when it happened. And the most common example for this one would be like bed bugs or cockroaches. They'd actually have a forensic entomologist come in to like see where the infestation started, what could have caused it. Um, Halifax is probably a really good place for forensic entomologists to live because um, mm, yeah, yeah, bed <laughs> bugs are <laughs> bed I... bugs run rampant, and so do cockroaches. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't a friend know of cockroaches mine. were in Halifax. A friend of mine had to, like, cancel her lease because of a cockroach infestation that the landlord didn't disclose until they had moved in. Something like that. Oh, my gosh. Oh, that's so gross. Like, I have a mouse problem, but at least those are cute. (laughs) Yes. My mom's going to hate that you said that. (laughs) Oh, oh, she knows. She knows they're here. She's terrified of mice. (laughs) Oh, your mom. I thought you said my My mom. mom. I was like, oh, no, she's okay. (laughs) <laughs> is no, she? they're so mom. cute <laughs> nope they're terrifying to her That's they are so very fast does she like i mean yeah That's does she like cockroaches so 
Like, um, would your mom be more comfortable with a cockroach infestation than a mouse infestation? I'm going to say yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm going to say yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, but anyways, kind of jumping back to urban forensics. Uh, these cases, again, could be both civil and criminal. Um, but an important thing to keep an eye out for these are the markings on people's skins. So with like bed bugs or cockroaches, I don't know why I stumbled on that. Um, their bite marks um, will be present often on living people's flesh. And this, what I found, can be mis- mistaken as abuse marks, which I wasn't aware of. Um, so it's important, really important in this sense, to get an entomologist or a forensic entomologist in to get their insight on it to either um, like be able to include or exclude any abuse that's happening. But lastly, the subfield we're probably all most familiar with is the medical legal forensic entomology. And so this, if you've ever seen Bones, this is what Jack Hodgins does. He just loves his bugs and blends them up and all of that fun stuff. Um, This is in regards to insects being found on human remains, and their main purpose is to help identify the amount of time that's passed since their death. So trying to figure out this post-mortem interval. And there are a lot of other um, uses for insects in addition to just trying to figure out PMI, which I'll get into, but this is kind of the primary um, purpose for these bugs. And these insects are considered necrophagous, um, and this is because they feed on corpses and eat dead matter. So that's fun. Um, and so a sweet spot for forensic entomology to be the most accurate and beneficial is um, about after three days. By that time, it's sometimes the only method that can be effectively used to determine postmortem interval. That's not to say, though, that like forensic entomology isn't useful in the first 72 hours after death. It's just that it's there's other forensic tools and measures that can be the same, like as effective or even more effective than um, forensic entomology in these cases. So it's better to kind of use those tools first and then use it as kind of a backup, a corroborating piece. Um, and then after these three days, though, this is this is where um, entomology becomes a huge thing. And so to try and figure out the elapsed time since death, there are two main methods that forensic entomologists use. And it also depends on the circumstances of the case as to which method will be used. So the first method is by using the age and development of maggots present. And this is generally used... Um, when like less than a month has passed since death, but typically within the first few days and weeks is the main time frame. And the second method is using successional waves of insects. And so this is generally when death occurred at least a month ago, and this can be up to years that have passed. Um, and so this is done after, obviously if two weeks have passed, um, you get more generations of flies. It becomes difficult to assess when it happened. This is when the successional waves become really um, useful. But insects are considered the first witnesses to a crime. And so it's blowflies and what are called flesh flies um, that are the first ones to arrive at a corpse. I've never heard of a flesh fly. I hope I never have to encounter one. Doesn't sound very nice. Um, but I will be talking about the blowfly life cycle um, for pretty well all of it. Um, but all kind of insects follow the same general cycle. Like in all of my sources, they were just saying like egg and then pupae and like stuff like that. So I assume it's going to be blowflies. Uh, but that's what we're going to go with for this. So um, when they have arrived to a corpse... They're going to lay their eggs on the body, on the body. And this is typically in any natural orifice. Um, Think of that as you will, where the eggs are going. 
Um, but if wounds are present, they'll also lay their eggs there in the wounds. And so it's said that a single blowfly, blowfly can lay up to 2,000 eggs during its lifetime. Uh, so it's safe to say that a lot are present. Um, and I will note, though, it's between 200 and 2,000. Because I read 2,000 on one site or a couple sources like throughout their whole life. But then I also read that they can lay up to 300 in like one setting, one kind of leg aing batch. Yeah. So the there's a lot of eggs. Um, and that's for one fly. So if a lot of flies show up, you're going to deal with a lot of eggs. So like I said, they lay in clumps of about 300 at max. And the life cycle of these insects are fairly predictable with the research that's been conducted, and they can really help in giving an accurate PMI, and they go through six different parts of development. And so I'll give a generalized timeline, but keep in mind that there are various factors that can develop the time frame and the development of these um, insects. But anyways, the egg will hatch about a day into what's called... Um, a first instar larvae. So a fly comes, lays eggs, a day, ha a day passes, and now they are in this first instar. And this basically just means the first larval stage. And so these first instar larvae will feed on the corpse and any fluid that's present. And they continue to mold into a second instar larvae after about another day. So this stage starts to move around um, in what are called masses. So it's just like the clumps of maggots that you've probably seen. Um, those are masses. So they move around in these masses while they continue to feed on the corpse. And then the final instar phase, the third instar, is where they significantly increase in size and continue to feed on the corpse. And so these three larval stages... Um, they can be determined based on their size and the amount of spiracles they have. And these are just breathing holes. So um, in the case of like the Stephen Truscott case, um, if they had said that the eggs or sorry, the flies couldn't have laid their eggs the day prior or something like that because they'd be so much bigger. It's because within this like one day time frame, their size dramatically changes, um, which I assume is one of the key pieces of evidence that they used in that. But during this third instar phase, the larvae will eventually stop feeding on the corpse and then they move away from it. So they kind of like disperse out from the body to try and find a safe and dry place to pupate, it's called. And so they'll typically move, um, if clothes are present, they'll move to clothes um, or even in the soil. So when collection's happening, they say to check like cuffs of sleeve a few centimeters down into the soil. You get a lot of like pockets. They'll like hide in there. So that's fun. And it's during this stage that no feeding happens on the body. And so they're just moving away from the corpse, no feeding. This is the pre-pupa stage. And there's about two days between the second instar and the third, and then another four days in this pre-pupa stage. So once away from the corpse, they loosen themselves from their outer skin, and this loosened <laughs> outer skin will harden around them, and it creates a protective outer shell. And this is known as a pupal case. And this keeps them safe for when they're going through metamorphosis, um, just from any environmental and predation problems, I guess. And so they'll initially be really pale in color, but after a few hours, they'll darken to a deep brown. So if pale pupas are found at a crime scene, it's really important to collect them since they can help determine how long it's been and how, like, especially how long it's been since they just turned into that pupa, if that makes sense. So it helps narrow down that time frame. Um, after about 10 days of being in this pupil case, an adult fly will emerge. They leave an empty pupil case behind them um, and they say goodbye. 
but these cases are important because it's evidence that a full generation of flies has passed and that a new cycle has started. So these flies that are now grown adults doing their own thing will start mating, feeding on the corpse as well, and then they lay even more eggs. And so this cycle continues uh, until there is no matter left for them to eat. So it can take quite a while. Um, but like the, the individual said in medieval times, three flies could clean a horse as fast as a lion. So take that as you will. <laughs> but from the time period of the adults hatching to um, them laying eggs, that's another about two days in between. So as I mentioned, lots of variables that can influence the timing of each stage. Um, some of these are the availability of food. So as I mentioned, they will eat until there's no matter, dead matter left for them to eat. Um, so it's not really the case in a lot of um, like homicide cases when there's bodies. I think this would more so be smaller animals. Um, if they eat up all of the dead matter quickly, this could determine what their developmental stage will be like. Um, another is the environmental temperature. And this is kind of the main uh, thing that can influence development stage. So because they're cold-blooded, temperature can greatly impact their development. So by increasing temperature this can increase or does increase their metabolism, which then increases developmental stage. So they're going to develop a lot faster, which is going to affect your PMI. So it's really important to take into consideration um, the temperature that day and kind of the prior days to that. And so the same can be said for the other end of the spectrum. With lower temperatures, you're going to have a lower and slower metabolism, which slows down the developmental process which is quite neat. And so by analyzing these regional temperatures, as well as the oldest insect stage present, so this could be like a fly or like that third instar larvae, um, just depending how much time's passed, um, entomologists are able to estimate a given day or range of days where the first insects would have laid their eggs on the corp. So based on this time frame, they can then estimate a PMI so, for example, if the oldest insects are determined to be, say, like seven days old, this means that the body has to have been there for a minimum seven days. Because if they're seven days old and if they hatched from that body, they have to be seven days old. And then you can kind of assume that um, there's about a day or two before that, that where all of the... Um, no, it'd be more days than that. Anyways, at least seven days. Add a couple here or there, and then that's your PMI. But once an adult fly has emerged, it's pretty well impossible, from what I read, to determine which insects came from which generation, which makes sense. You can't really, like, DNA test a pupil casing and DNA test a fly. That's just not reasonable. Um... And so this is why this method is only useful up until that first emergence and that first adult um, generation comes through. Because once a full generation is completed, the time of death um, can't be as accurately and effectively measured by these generations. Um, so this is when successional waves comes into play. And this method is pretty much based on the fact that as a body decomposes, becomes fresh to not fresh, um, it's going to go through a lot of different decomp phases. And so it's during these phases that the body becomes attractive to some insects and less attractive to other insects. So this will determine which insects are coming to feed on, say, this flesh body or this fresh body, excuse me, feed on a mid decomposed body for example um that sort of thing and as mentioned blowflies and flesh flies are the first to the body so they typically arrive within the first 24 hours in the spring summer and fall in canada 
Um, but if blood or other bodily fluids are present, they can even arrive within minutes, which I thought was really interesting. So these flies are obviously interested in fresh corpses, but others are not. So they'll come in later, and some come in during what's called the protein fermentation phase. Um, and these insects are known as cheese skippers. <laughs> um, yeah. So these are among the insects that love not fresh bodies. In addition to those liking fresh and fermented corpses, um, some insects, not laughing at it, I'm just laughing at in general, keep in mind. Um, some insects will come to the body to feed on the other insects, though. So they're not coming to feed on the corpse, they're coming to feed on the insects that are feeding on the corpse. So, you're welcome for all of that description. Um, and because there's this overlap, then, of insect activity, of some coming in, some leaving, some eating others, all of this, if there's the knowledge of this overlap as well as the local like insect species, um, as well as what stage of decomposition um, the body's in when these species come into play, this can really help narrow down a time, a time period that's passed since death. So this can really help with PMI. And there have apparently been some cases where this method's proven effective up to like several years that have passed, which I thought was interesting. I don't know if it was in a very cold climate because I couldn't see a body taking that long to decompose. Um, but it has been effective after a couple of months, which is neat. And so the collection of insect evidence at crime scenes is the most important stage of investigation, and this should be the first thing done. Unfortunately, entomologists aren't often called in until after a body's been removed from a scene. So that's not great. It can quite impair postmortem interval estimations. Um, but sometimes, too, that... Like, they won't even see a body until it's been brought into the morgue, which is less good. Um, so they, a lot of the times, rely on the collections of, like, the investigators that are working the scene. So if the investigators don't... In, well, sorry, stroke. <laughs> um, if the investigators don't know what they're doing, entomologists don't really have anything to work off of because they don't have that information in front of them. Um, and so a handful of information can be given and can be provided by these insects in addition to postmortem interval. So they can help determine whether a body's been moved after death. So some insects that are found on a body could be determined not to be native to that one area. And this would indicate that these insects are native to another area, which must have meant the body had to have been there first for the flies to lay their eggs on them. Um, they can also help determine if the body's been disrupted after death, or even if the killers returned and like disrupted the body in any way. Um, because any disruption of the body is going to cause a disruption in the insect life cycle. Um, so you're going to have kind of that impairment there that you can work off of. And they're also helpful in determining placements of wounds. So like I had said, they either go to natural orifices or if wounds are present, they'll go there. So if maggots and masses of maggots are congregating kind of away from the natural orifice that could be really indic indicative of a wound um, because decomposition does uh, disturb the body I guess in a way becomes less viewable for um, evidence to the integumentary system so this way depending where the maggots are this can help um, investigators kind of narrow down if something had happened. So they could focus in um, future investigations on the bones, say, in that area. 
Another thing is that maggots also bioaccumulate. So this can be helpful if drugs were present. And that's, I thought was really interesting. Uh, this always makes me think of Hodgins when he puts all of the bl- bugs in a blender and he uses that to figure out, I think it was for toxicity. Don't do that. I don't think that's what they actually do. Um, okay, I have a question. I yeah. put up a story that said fly larvae can reveal a presence of drugs and can retain human DNA. True or false? Is that true? Okay. Yeah. Because you said that. something, okay, you said something about um, you can't DNA test a fly. And I was like, oh my gosh, did I get that wrong? Because I definitely oh. had that, that that was true. But then I was like, but the source that I got it from said that it was true, but you're saying that it's false. So I'm really confused right now. But, no, okay. like, sorry, I was talking about like, you can't test a fly's DNA to see if that fly matches that pupil case, if that makes sense. Oh, okay. so not the DNA of <clears throat> of um a victim. Of the person. Yeah. It's okay. yeah, that's kind of what I meant. Like you're not gonna test the pupil case to see if that specific fly belongs to that specific case. Okay. I was really confused, but thank you for clearing that up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, perfect. Um but yeah, so flies can keep DNA, They that whole thing, um, and drugs. I will get into the DNA in like a bit, but um, bugs can also place suspects at a scene. So I think this is kind of along the lines of like parasitology and when like we looked at ticks and different um, species like that could travel on clothing or like you get a bite in that sense i think it would be quite similar um to forensic entomology in this aspect and it's sometimes used in child or senior abuse and neglect cases which i thought was also interesting so something called cutaneous my myasis myasis (laughs) okay that's the word we're going with (laughs) All right. (laughs) Anyways, this thing, this process can occur to wounds or uncleaned areas of living people. And so in the case of child neglect, the onset of a maggot infestation can actually provide a minimum time interval time interval since that child has last had a diaper change. So if they've been sitting in their diaper for a very long time. Um, obviously that's gonna be appetizing to some creepy crawlies, um, go through that and yeah, they can use it to determine the last diaper change. That's terrible. Yeah. That's necessary. I I was gonna say when I was reading that, I was like, that can't, that can't happen. Like there's no way, but nope, there's some really not great people in the world that I know this definitely has been an issue in the past and has been really important. Wow. Do you think that, I just, like, with the Goler family clan, do you think that was something where they, like, literally had, like, maggots and et cetera? Probably. Just, like, living on their I know person? they were dirty. Yeah. I know they were dirty. I I would think the one Goler that, I think he was paralyzed, um... I feel like he would be the one to most likely have yeah. any maggot situation going on, if that was even a thing. Um, yeah, because I had, didn't have running water or anything like that. So it is Ugh. a possibility. Gross. It's so sad that that can even happen to like living people and like babies who are so right? helpless. I know. That's the thing, too. Like they can't. They they can't do it themselves. Like they can't just say, "Mom, I got maggots." Like yeah, they can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Not a thing. Um, but yeah. And so, lastly, I did want to say, as Journey mentioned, that blowfly maggots can be used to recover victim DNA. So they store their food. So in this case, the victim, um, in a part of their gut gut called a crop. And so since obviously they're feeding on the body, this is going to contain the DNA from the victim and from that body. This can be helpful in cases where 
either like the body's been moved and there's just kind of a couple maggots left around or if really there's nothing left to be identified and there's still maggots um this can be helpful in that case as well um but of course like all things there are some limitations so first as we discussed environmental temperatures are very important um in most cases though weather records come from weather stations like several kilometers away like most people aren't killing under weather towers that's just not something people think to do um but this is trying to be overcome through setting up mini weather stations at death sites when they come to uh, the crime scene initially and so they'll compare this data from local weather stations to um, the data obviously that they're getting with those mini ones and so forensic entomology in Canada is seasonal. And so this is going to be like any other place that goes through these drastic four season temperatures. This means that its use in winter is pretty limited unless it's been a pretty mild winter. Um, this can sometimes be an advantage, though. Uh, at one of the sources I read, she's a forensic entomologist out in BC. She was saying that she was she's able to... Uh, identify that a victim who was found in the spring was actually killed the previous fall based on the weather changes and how that would have affected development and all of that fun stuff that's really interesting it's yeah crazy that she can learn that much just from bugs oh she's a phenomenal some of the sources i was reading she loves her bugs that's so cool um Simon Fraser University, uh, Dr. Anderson um, out in BC. I recommend looking up her stuff. I found a source too. I'll include it on our list. She actually provided like collection process. I don't know if it was meant to be given to like police services and all of this to keep in mind, but it was like how to collect eggs, larvae, adults, that whole thing. And then she provided collection sample sheets. So everything that you would need to fill out to basically submit during a case, which is super neat. Because usually you don't yeah. see the, like, criminal. That's whistle. so cool. Like, yeah. procedure. Yeah, yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. Right? Um. So other limitations... Um, or that body may have been disposed in a way that it excludes insects. So obviously, if you have no insects, you can't really have forensic entomology. So this could be by like freezing, burial, if they're wrapped so tightly that insects can't really get in. And this could affect the development of life cycles if they even are present in that case. But all in all, forensic entomology has been a effective and useful tool to the field but pretty well with like all other sciences um more research is needed especially in different climate zones is what i've been seeing like we do have a lot of information for like canada and that kind of thing but it's it, it's really important to get information from all over the globe to be able to kind of i don't know create a database and have these bugs to check But yeah, that is my bug talk. Well, that was awesome. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. Bugs Bugs are are so really gross. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Same thing. That's funny. (laughs) Um, I have a quick fun bug fact for you since I've honestly been thinking about this since you said beetles earlier. Okay. Um, Did you know that one fifth of all living organisms so like single cell organisms bacteria humans everything and a quarter of all animal species are beetles what really oh my gosh yeah so 20 percent of all living organisms and 25 percent of all animal species that's a high percentage there's a lot of beetles (laughs) oh my gosh that makes me so uncomfortable. The fact, though, that, like, I never see beetles is concerning. <laughs> like, where are they, then? <laughs> where are the beetles? 
where are the Beatles? I want to see the Beatles. Actually, no, keep the Beatles away. I'll look at pictures, but. Please let us know if any of our listeners knew that or if you have any more fun bug facts, because that's kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, thank you, Rebecca and Nicole, for telling us all about Stephen Truscott and forensic entomology. It was very educational and interesting, and I loved it. Um, our next topic is forensic accounting and Al Capone, which I am very excited about. And Rebecca got a job as a anti-money laundering investigator. And so she's on the forensic accounting science for this episode. So that's really exciting. And pretty soon she'll have like actual firsthand knowledge of like forensic accounting world. So that's really exciting. And congrats to her. Thanks. <laughs> You're so welcome. That's so exciting. I'm so excited to start, honestly. That's awesome. Okay, so I do have a joke for you. It kind of sucks after Rebecca's fun fact. Um, <laughs> wow, way to but... dampen things, Rebecca. Come on. <laughs> anyway, um, which insect is smarter than a talking parrot? Uh, hmm. It's definitely, a, my mind just went blank to all types of insects. What? <laughs> Same. Smarter than a than a talking parrot? Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's a talking a insect? No, it's a spelling bee. Oh, oh. my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's I cringy, like that but one. <laughs> that's what you get for Googling bug jokes for kids. So <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. All a right. <laughs> Well, Rebecca, did you want to tell our listeners where they can find us if they have any questions or comments or concerns? I would love to. Um, so you guys can find us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook at What the Forensics. Uh, we're really active on Facebook, and we also very regularly update Insta, so those are probably the best social media pages to follow our stuff on. Uh, we also have a Twitter. It's not updated as frequently, but you can still give it a follow at WT Forensics PC. Um, also check out our website, whatthefrensics.ca. It's got all of the source images and source uh, links that we were telling you about throughout the episode. Uh, and if you want to get in contact with us, our email is whatthefrensics at gmail.com. Awesome. Thank you. Well, this has been another episode of What the Forensics. We hope you guys enjoyed it and we will see you next time. Bye. 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 <laughs> Just a reminder to everyone that we are not professionals in the forensic science field. We are just students who are learning and want to share what we are learning with our listeners. We're trying to give you the most accurate information, but we are human and we can make mistakes. Thank you so much for listening and we hope to see you next week.